faith challenge. David was being persecuted. He didn't understand that. And as a result, he flees. He makes mistakes. He becomes, as the text says, for the first time afraid of something. Uh, he doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't know why it's happening. And the result is his faith is weakened. And that's a natural response from humans. When I find myself in a place of fear, things happening, I don't know, I don't know why they're happening. Uh, life's caving in on me. Well, fear is a natural response. And that fear has a definite impact on my faith. If I don't realize it soon enough, uh, my faith can be weakened and I can, I can find myself in a position where I'm worse off than before because I don't know what's going on. Now, I thought about it. There are many things in life that can create that fear factor that cause us to, to have our faith weakened. It can be an issue in our job, a threatened job loss, a threatened job demotion, a threatened you did something wrong and you got to pay for it. Uh, there are many things that happen in our place of work that can cause us to have a fear moment and our faith be weakened because we don't understand what's happening. Because we're being attacked, our income is being attacked, our ability to provide for our families being attacked, that can lead to fear. Relationships can create fear. If you're married between your spouse or other people, your children, our health issues can create fear in our life. Uh, life in general can create fear in our life. Uh, sin can create fear in my life. Uh, at least think if I embrace sin, definitely causes a faith challenging event because if I'm embracing sin, then my faith obviously is, is faded already or soon will be because if I'm telling God that God's wrong, well, there's no faith there, right? So there are many things in life that contribute to an attack on our faith and weaken our faith. For David, it was... He was being attacked for doing good, did not understand why he attacked for doing good, and as a result, he began to have his faith weakened, basically didn't understand. And fear entered his life, didn't understand. In chapter 23, God begins, actually chapter 22, God begins to rebuild David's faith, to restore David to his faith and where he was before uh, it was weakened by life events and life circumstances. And the steps that God takes in David's life to rebuild his faith, I think, are the same steps he was taking in our life. In fact, I can see many times in the past where God used the same approach in, to me to restore my faith when I have my faith challenged or weakened because of whatever events are going on in my life. So there are five steps we see in the text that God takes. First, chapter 22, verse 2. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, David. And he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. The very first thing that happens when my faith is attacked and challenged and it begins to be weakened and I question is I feel like I'm very much alone. No one else is being attacked like I'm being attacked. Like I'm being persecuted. No one understands my situation. No one cares about my situation. No one's here to stand with me and help me and support me and encourage me. The natural response is to have a pity party to feel sorry for yourself, to sit there and wallow in your pity and feel sorry for yourself because life is so rough and it's been so bad to me and it's just wiped me out. Well, David can be in that position. He's run the wilderness. He is alone. And then he finds himself in a place where God brings people to him who are also at odds with King Saul, who are also in Saul's crosshairs, if you will, to be attacked or persecuted or imprisoned or destroyed, they find themselves with David. It's interesting how God brings this together. A bunch of people, all who are being pursued or disliked by Saul, come together into a group, what? Pity party, right? They all come together and feel sorry for themselves. They get out their violins and play sad music and sing sad songs and feel sorry for each other. No. They come together as a support group. And it's amazing if you stop and look at the situation. David has every reason to feel sorry for himself. I have no clue why I'm being persecuted for doing good. Worth enjoying that. But when a group shows up and David being a natural leader realizes, or God realizes, David's response to that is going to be to try and encourage the group, to try and build up the group who are also being disenfranchised by Saul or attacked by Saul, pursued by Saul. When the group shows up, it gives David opportunity to not feel sorry for himself, not have a pity party, but also opportunity to talk about what's going on. Now, 
Now I've done a lot of critical incident stress management training back in the day, the hundreds of contact hours and that kind of training and stuff. And everything they say about critical incident stress is the number one way to get through that stress, overcome that stress, and file that stress away is talk about it. Sit down and talk about it. Well, this group that comes to David suddenly becomes group therapy. They're probably all sitting around talking about that Sergeant King saw and how he wants to destroy me or did destroy me or took my lands or my cattle or my property. It becomes group therapy where they can discuss it and talk about it and begin the healing process <coughs> of what they've experienced through being persecuted <coughs> by Saul. I find this very interesting because David doesn't pursue this. He didn't ask people to come to him, but God brings people to him who had the same issues he has, the same hurt he has, the same pain he has, the same problem as Saul he has. So that immediately becomes a support group for David and for each other. When God goes to restore our faith, if I'm faltering in my faith, my faith is for whatever reason, and I go home and close the doors and begin to have a pity party, that's the worst thing I can do. If I'm talking about other folks who are also hurting, that's the best thing I can do. Because for one, I don't want to see you whine and complain day after day. I'm going to try and build you up, pick you up, and encourage you, right? Otherwise, I'm probably going to leave. That group coming together is God's way of starting David toward his restoration in his faith. You're not in this alone. In 1 Kings 19, we have a story of Elijah. Elijah has defeated the, the prophets, the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. They've all been killed by Elijah calling the fire of God down. Elijah runs from his life from Jezebel. And he runs, he runs, he runs to the wilderness. And he gets to the wilderness and he gets there and he says to God, I alone in all of Israel worship you. Uh, that's quite a bold statement. Elijah thinks he's the last man standing who truly knows God. But he felt that way because of life circumstances and persecution. Of course, God tells Elijah, no, I have 7,000 men who have bowed to me to Baal. There are many more than just you in Israel who worship me as God alone. Again, we feel like we're all alone, but we're not. And so for David, I think, hopefully for us also, when we're in that situation, he will bring people around us who are also hurting. That we can help and encourage, that therefore helps and encourages us. The second, God sends Gad to encourage David. 22 verse 5. The prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold, depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Gad's a prophet. He's a man of God. David knows that. He's probably well known to the people of Israel as being a prophet, a man of God, who speaks for God. The idea of prophet being fortune teller is not the primary thing that they did. Their most important responsibility was to tell you what God says. And most every time, that is what God said in God's word. Uh, for Gad, that would be the first five books of Moses our Bible. So Gad comes to David with a word from God. I find it interesting that David needs to hear from God. He went to Samuel, didn't hear what he needed to hear. He went to Jonathan and was encouraged, but still he has to run. So when Gad, the man of God, shows up, you got to be thinking David's going to hear a mighty word of encouragement from God. And what Gad says is, you got to move. Do you feel the spiritual encouragement of that statement? <laughs> you got to move. <laughs> However, where I see God in, in, in Gad with David is David can't stay where he's at because Saul's going to come get him and kill him if he stays where he's at. God knows that. God sends Gad with a simple message to David, you need to move someplace else. And then David does. But what that would tell me if I'm David is God has not abandoned me. He could have moved my spirit personally to move. But God sent me his prophet, his designated prophet, that all his moves is a prophet, to tell me a message from God. Simply, you need to move. That fact that Gad shows up as God's prophet, as God's man, to give David instruction and direction on what to do, to me is a mighty statement from God to David. I've got this. I got your back. I'm going to protect you. I'm watching over you. Get out of here. Move someplace else because you will be in danger here. 
Now, for me, if I'm in an extremely weakened state of faith, I need a man of God to come to me and give me direction. Think about it. If my faith is weak and I know it, I don't want to make any decisions of any importance whatsoever because I don't know if I'm talking to God or my emotions or my feeling or the aspirant to it. Uh, if my faith is not strong, I need a man of God to come to me and come alongside me to give me direction. And I think for us, primarily in the church today, that man of God may be the Bible itself. The Bible should speak to us and tell us exactly what we need to be doing. Uh, I know that's how it works for me primarily. But at the same time, if there's a man in my life who I know walks with God, and I'm in a moment of weakness, and he comes to me and says, you need to do this, I feel like God's telling me to tell you to do this, I probably should listen to him. So my question then becomes, who's the man of God in your life that would come to you and do that? And I would hope the pastor should be that, that person. Uh, pastor, teacher, prophet should be that person. And I would hope that I would see my responsibility, take it seriously, and be there for you if that were to ever happen. But my other question is, are you a man of God in somebody's life? See, as believers, as priesthood of the believer, we're all on the same plane, we're all on the same level, we're the same God, same spirit, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, we're all the same inside the Holy Spirit. We all can be walking with God as much as Gad was, or Paul was, or Peter. Are you qualified? to be a man of God to someone who's hurt you? Have you ever considered yourself to be the person who God would send as he did Gad to a hurting person to give them direction? That's a little harder question to answer, isn't it? <laughs> but think about it. As a believer, you should see yourself as that person. As someone who God can use and speak through to a hurting person to help give them direction and what's going on in their life. Third, God leads David back to work. Chapter 23, verses 1 through 13. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keba and are plundering the threshing floor. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and deliver Keba. But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid. Here in Judah, how much more than if we go to Keilah against the ranks of the Philistines? Then David inquired the Lord once more. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, and he led away their livestock and struck them with a the great slaughter. Thus David delivered the inhabitants of Keilah. Let's stop there the first half. So David is sent back to work by God. What's David's primary job once he has killed Goliath and called by God to serve King Saul? His primary job is man of war. You are to go and defeat the enemies of Israel, the enemies of God. So David has done that. Saul's running him out and wants to kill him. David's in hiding, and God brings a group to him to support him. God brings Gad to him to encourage him. And now God puts David back to work. Back to work is defeating the enemies of Israel. The Philistines are that primary enemy at this time. So God sends David to defeat the Philistines at Keilah. Interesting how this plays out because they tell David the Philistines are attacking the city. Saul's not there to defend the city and is not coming to defend the city. So David asks God, do you want me to go defend the city? You see, God put David in a position where one, he should feel comfortable man of war, and two, he must ask God what to do. God's restoring David's faith. God's drawing David back to him by putting him back to work. So David asked God, what do I do? God says, go, go fight and go win. David's men say, no, we're scared, which makes David go back to God a second time and ask, what do I do? And God says again, go, you'll defeat the Philistines. God has this circumstance that draws David to him twice. God has this circumstance where David's surrounded by men who are afraid and don't want to follow God. And David says, we're going. That's a huge faith step for David. So it's a great 
way that God is drawing David back to himself and restoring his faith. Time to go back to work. We're going to fight the Philistines. Nobody wants to go. We get all scared, but you're going to lead them anyway, and you'll be victorious. That is a huge stepping stone for David in his faith and drawing him back to believing in God and trusting God. So he does what God says to do when he goes and defeats the Philistines. 6 through 13. Now it came about when Abathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah that he came down with an ephod in his hand. When it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah, Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he shut himself in by entering a city with double gates and bars. So Saul summoned all the people of war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Now David knew that Saul was plotting evil against him, so he said to Abathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. Then David said, of, of the, then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that Saul is seeking to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down just as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant, and the Lord said he will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men to the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. Then David and his men, about 600 now, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the pursuit. And in verses 1 through 5, David follows God's direction, does what God says to do, goes out and defeats the Philistines. He's totally in God's will, totally trusting God in what he's supposed to be doing. And the reward for trusting God and following God and doing God's will is Saul's coming now to Keilah to persecute you. Not only that, the people you just saved from the Philistines will turn on you and turn you over to Saul to be killed by Saul. What got David started to begin with? He's being persecuted. He doesn't understand why. He's being attacked for doing good. He doesn't understand why. As soon as God puts him back to work and doing his job as a man of war, immediately the same thing happens again. Now you would think, that's a mistake. Won't that just totally challenge David's faith and wipe it out? Well, no. In fact, this is a very pivotal part for David and his faith rebuilding because David must understand and realize, I have been faithful to God. I asked God personally, do I go to battle? And he said yes. I asked him twice, and he said yes. And we were victorious. And now... Saul wants to kill me. People I just saved want to kill me also. David's in a position of, do I quit? Do I give up? Or do I stay faithful and trust God that this is the way he wants it to go? Very pivotal moment for David in his faith. Because think about it. If you're doing good and the king wants to kill you, you run and hide and you get someplace where you're safe and you feel God, you know God's telling you to go out and fight the Philistines and do good, and you do good again, and the reward of that is they want to kill you for doing good, why would you keep doing good? Would not your faith be challenged here again? Well, absolutely. God wants David to make a choice. God wants us to make a choice. Are you going to follow me and trust me regardless of what happens, or are you going to abandon it all and go sit in your hole and have a pity party? It's our choice. And make no mistake, Jesus said, when, not if, you're persecuted, rejoice. If I am truly serving God and doing what he called me to do, I will be persecuted. David persecuted for doing good. David chooses God, and as a result, his faith is strengthened greatly. Fourth, God sends Jonathan to affirm and encourage David. 23, verses 16 through 18. And Jonathan saw his son arose and went to David at Horish and encouraged him in God. Thus he said to him, Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul my father will not find you, and you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you, and Saul my father knows that also. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed at Horish while Jonathan went to his house. Uh, Saul and the people are seeking David's life again. David goes into hiding. And God does, I think, one of the most marvelous things in David's faith <clears throat> building. He sends Jonathan to David. He doesn't send Samuel, the great prophet, to David. He doesn't send Gad, the prophet, to David now. He 
he sends Jonathan, David's best friend, David's mentor. And Jonathan comes, and Jonathan does one very, very important thing. In chapter 16, the last part of the verse, encouraged him in God. Now, when he says, my dad will find you, you'll be king, I'll stand beside you, that's great things to say. But the most important thing Jonathan does is he encourages David in God. We've already established that Jonathan walked with God. Jonathan knew God. He's a believer. We know that David's a believer and walks with God. The two believers are best friends. They've come together here again. And God brings Jonathan to David to solidify, to submit his faith forever with God. Jonathan's the key, I think to making sure David never turns away again. He sins, yes, but I don't see his faith ever wavering again the rest of his life in the Bible after this. So God sends Jonathan to encourage him, and the most important thing Jonathan says or does, he does it in God. Jonathan says that my father will not find you. Jonathan says you will be king, and I will stand beside you and encourage you. Jonathan has totally surrendered what God's called him to do, and that surrender of Jonathan to God's call, which is lose his kingship, is a major affirmation to David, who takes that kingship and becomes king in Jonathan's place. Jonathan's agreement with that, submitting to God, is a huge affirmation and encouragement and boost to David. In all ways, especially his faith in God. And of course, I have another question here. Are you that kind of friend? <coughs> I, I agree, Diana. I hope so. <laughs> Jonathan came to see David for one purpose, to build up and encourage David. You know, I know we come together and we sit down and we eat and we talk. We, we have fellowship one-on-one or one of many. Hopefully, we're thinking and listening to what our friends are saying. Because in our culture, we usually won't come out and tell you, I've heard you. We won't come out and tell you, I'm having issues, having troubles with this, that, other thing. We hide everything. Hopefully we are listening so we can ask questions to encourage people to share as they need to for prayer support, for affirmation, for fellow believers. Jonathan was that man. He was that kind of friend. Fifth, God proves himself as David's protector, uh, beginning in verse 19. The Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, is David not hiding with us in the strongholds at Horish on the hill of Hakalon? Oh, Hakalon, which is on the south of Jishimon. <clears throat> now then, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to do so, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. Saul said, May you be blessed of the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go now, make, make more sure, and investigate and see his place where his haunt is. And who had seen him there? For I am told that he is very cunning. So look and learn about all the, the hiding places where he hides himself and return to me with certainty, and I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. Then they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Moan in the Arabah to the south of Jishimon. When David and his men went to seek him, they told David, and he came down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Moab. And when Saul heard it, he pursued David in the wilderness of Moab. So went, Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men to seize them. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid on the land. So Saul returned from pursuing David and went to meet the Philistines. Therefore, they called that place the Rock of Escape. David went up from there and stayed in the stronghold of En Gedi. God demonstrates to David, I will protect you. How do you do that? <clears throat> David's on one side of the mountain and Saul's on the other side of the mountain. And they're going and scorch facing each other. <clears throat> uh, when Saul is about to surround and capture David, Saul receives a message from someone saying, The Philistines are coming. You must come help us. And Saul has to retreat from pursuing David. Jonathan has just told David, my, Saul, my dad will never catch you. And now David just lived that reality. It looks really, really bad for David here. And God intervenes and removes Saul from the scene. 
when our faith is challenged and we hit that rock bottom and we turn to God, He is there to draw us to Him. He does everything He can to restore our faith through others or through His very presence. Now, we have an advantage every day here. The Holy Spirit resides here. I'm never without God's presence. I don't need to see a priest or an ephod or anything else. God is here. When I am weak and when I falter, I know what I need to do. Look to God. That I tell most everybody I come in contact with in a faith crisis, do what you know you have to do. Have a quiet time. Spend time reading God's Word. You don't want to. It doesn't make sense. You feel alone and abandoned. Get in God's Word and read it and let God speak to you. If my faith is ever being challenged or weakened, I read God's Word. Usually something like Matthew's Gospel. That's where God speaks to you. But for you and I, if your faith is we can reach out. You have people in your church who want to help you. For you and I, be that person. Be Gad. Be Jonathan. Be that individual who not only is willing and able, but is walking with God in such a way you can be an example of motivation and encouragement to your friends when they hit that low spot, when life collapses in on them. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for your great love. Thank you, Father, for your presence in our life. Thank you that you've saved us and you've given us an opportunity to walk with you and know you. Draw us to you to be the people you need us to be, to represent you, to reach the world around to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us an opportunity, Father, and confidence and boldness to speak your word to the lost who we come into contact with and to encourage the saved, our brothers in Christ, who we live with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.